Hello, in this video, we're going to be covering um, 15.3, which is conservative vector fields and in, um, independence of path. So on a lot of the problems, there's not, again, a lot of the sections, there's not a whole lot of problems. So in this particular section, we only have about seven problems. And some of them do have um, like three, four, and five. Um, they don't have any parts that are algorithmically generated, so I couldn't do those particular problems. But I did some pretty, uh, a good amount of other problems, so I felt like that was enough for you to try to get started on three, four, and six. You also want um, some kind of critical thinking to occur, right? So for you to figure things out on your own has to be in the course somewhat, okay? So for number one, I did do part A and I did part B one or I. I didn't do the double I only because um, if I had done that, I would have done the entire problem for you, okay? So I did leave um, the polar coordinate part to, to you. The only advice I give you when you do um, this part with the second curve is one, you know you should have the same answer. So I already know that that answer is gonna be five, six, just because that's the whole purpose of this uh, section is that it doesn't matter which path you take, you'll still get the same value. Um, but um, just remember your Jacobian, right? Um, remember that when you do change it from rectangular to quad quadrat or rectangular to polar, that instead of dx, dy, or dy, dx, it has to be r, dr, d theta, or r, d theta, dr, okay? There has to be that extra r multiplier in there, okay? And again, that comes from the Jacobian, which we learned about, um, but when we learned about conversion of polar coordinates, we just used that. Um, we didn't really know where that extra r came from until we got to the discussion about Jacobians. So for this section, um, they do still want us to do kind of like what we're doing in the previous section, just to verify that um, the vector field is uh, conservative. So your first component is essentially M, your second component is N. And then if I take the derivative of my first component with respect to Y, there's no Ys here, so I get zero. When I take the derivative of the second component with respect to X, again, no Xs, so it's just zero. Those are equivalent to each other, so it is conservative. Um, and what did it equal? It equaled zero for both, right? So this is the partial derivative notation. I just use um, the subscript notation. Again, both of them mean the partial derivative with respect to y. So for part A, it's or for part B, I'm sorry, it says verify that the value of this um, integral is the same for each parametric representation of C. So what I've done is the first one. So in the first one, our um, vector valued function is R1 and it's T in the I component and T squared in the J component. So I like to write it in component form. And then the T is going from zero to one, okay? Um, so R prime of T is going to be the derivative of this, which is one derivative of this, which is two T. And then my function, uh, my vector field needs to be in terms of T before I can plug it in here. Okay. Because T is my variable. So my, if I were to replace, um, remember this is X and this is Y. So if I were to replace this X with this, uh, value for x, it would become t squared. And if I would replace this with the y, it would also be t squared. Okay, this coincidence that's the same, it just happened to be that way. Now, in order for me to compute this, we're basically multiplying our uh, vector field in terms of t times the derivative of our um, curve that we were given, the vector valued function. So I have my t squared comma t squared dot product with one comma two t from here. And everything should be with respect to t. So the integral is going from t bound zero to one and derivative or integral with respect to t. So when I do the dot product, I'll get t squared plus two t cubed, which is here. 
When I integrate each of these two terms, I get these two terms. And then when I evaluate them at one and zero, I end up with the value five over six. So similarly, you will do the same thing. You will find R prime, get those two components, put your vector field in terms of T using the fact that x is sine and y is sine squared. Take that dot product. Again, you won't have just dt. Um, you should have, um, I think yours is theta. Oh, so you won't even need the r dr d theta. That's for when it's in two dimensions. This is just a single integral. So um, the it will be d theta instead of dt, OK? And then you would put your theta bounds, which are uh, apparently from zero to pi over two. So it's very similar to this. It's just using theta instead of T, okay? And then of course there's trig functions instead of just um, powers, okay? But should be able to do that one. And again, like I said, they're independent of class, so it still should be the same answer, but practice the mechanics of it all, especially with those trig functions, because we will have some more difficult trig functions later, okay? Um, now, oh, I didn't even need to turn my page yet. So for number two, I have this function here. And again, it's asking me if it's conservative. So I'm taking the derivative of this with respect to y. So this is a constant multiplier. And then I get this thing times 2y. So 3x squared times 2y is 6x squared y. Then here, I'm going to take the integral or the derivative of this with respect to x. So the two and the y act like constant multipliers, and this becomes three x squared, which is where the six uh, x squared y comes from. And over here, it was three x times two y, the same six x squared y. So they are the same, which means they are conservative. It didn't ask me for that derivative, the partial derivatives, but it was conservative. Now, number three, I do leave for you. Just remember that the derivative of a log is one over that argument times the derivative of the argument. That's kind of like the chain rule, right? So the derivative or the, yeah, the derivative of ln of x squared would be one over x squared times the derivative of x squared, which would be two x. And then those actually simplify and they get two over x in the end, okay? Just as an example. So don't forget how to take the derivative of the natural log. That's the only reason my hint is there. And then don't forget chain rule if this argument is not x itself. Okay. Number four is also partial derivatives. Um, so make sure you definitely look at those partials and tell whether or not this thing is conservative. Now you may have to go look at the notes because since there's three terms, there's not only m and n, but there's also a p. So if I go over um, to the lecture, I'm pretty sure it'll have that um, information in there. Might be in fifteen point two, actually. Because there's like three relationships that you need to check when there are three. And I can, it doesn't happen very often. So, of course, I don't memorize it. Um, just in calculus in general, that doesn't happen very often. So let me go back to 15.2 real quick, just so I can get you those um, relationships there. Because I don't think we had one in all of the problem. And I said I leave for you, but I definitely want to make sure that I have a, um,
at least draw your attention to it. I'm not going to write it down on the paper, but it should be in here somewhere. There we go. No, it's not in here. Okay, let me Google it real quick because I will have to need to um, check for observation of a vector field in three variables. There it is, that's what it is. That's what I wanted to see. Okay, so they named them different. They named them P, Q, and R, but I think your book um, labels them as M, N, and P. So then the three relationships that you wanna check is that um, that m y equals n x? You also want to check that m z is equal to p x, and then you want to check that q or not q n n z equals P1. Okay, that's what it is. Sorry about the different variables, but at least you have it on the paper, um, that relationship that they should have. So let me close that because that's not what we're working on. So remember, um, this is going to be your M, this is going to be your N, and this is going to be your P. So you are going to need to take the partial with respect to Y of M, and the partial with respect to X of N, this is the normal relationship that we check when it's only um, two components. But when our vector field has three components, then we also need to check these other two relationships. So we need to make sure that the derivative of the first term with respect to Z is the same as the uh, partial with of the third term with respect to X. Then you also need to check that the middle term with partial with respect to Z is the same as the last term partial with respect to Y. Okay, so you do have these relationships on paper. Um, and I'll leave you to do the mechanics of all that, but do make sure that all three are equal. If two of them are good and one of them is bad, the whole thing is not conservative. All three of these have to be equivalent in order for it to be considered conservative, okay? I tried to find somewhere in the slides and it doesn't quite say it in the way I wanted it to say it. So now you have it here, okay? Now for number five, it does want us to evaluate the line integral along this path. And then of course it gives us a second path. And since both of these paths uh, do have some stuff in red that would be automatically regenerated um, or alg algorithmically regenerated, I went ahead and did both parts. So for the first part, this is what I have for the first part. So for the first part, we have our vector uh, field here. We've got this is M and this is N. And then for our curve, we have the vector valued function um, T. And then I distributed this negative. So I already put negative T and then a negative and a negative would be positive eight. And then my t's are going from zero to eight. So my function, my vector uh, field in terms of t, I would replace the y with this, and then I would replace the x with t and the y with negative t plus eight. Here I replace the x with t, and then the x and the y with t and negative t plus eight. Um, I also found R prime over here on the side. So the derivative of this with respect to T is one and the derivative of the second component with respect to T is negative one. 
So for this line in a row, I put in my F in terms of T dot product with R prime. And of course, uh, with respect to DT. Now from here, um, I did go ahead and do that dot product. So you essentially get this term, both of these terms in the same signs. Um, and then you get this term would be negative. So if you've got two of these terms with negatives, then it's going to be negative two of them. And then this term would actually still remain positive, right? So it's going to be one times this, one times this, plus a negative one times this one. So those two negatives ended up making it a double, a negative two. Um, let's see. So then here, I factored out this common e to the power. And when I factored out that e, I ended up with eight minus two t. And so then um, if you do this here, if you let u equal negative t squared plus eight t, then du is actually negative two t plus eight dt. And that is exactly what I have there. Just the two terms are swapped, right? But it is the same thing. So I have u and du. So the integral of e to the u du is just e to the u. And so I just put what u was. Then I evaluated it from eight to zero. And when we plug in eight, you actually get negative 64 plus 64, which is a zero power. And when you plug in zeros, you get a zero power. So you have one minus one, which is just zero. And so that was the answer there for part A. Now for part B or double I, I think they called it B, not double I. This one was A. So for part B, again, same vector valued function. Um, but what I did was I just checked to see if it was conservative, because why would I do a whole nother integral if I don't need to, right? So I double checked to see that it was conservative. Um, and when I did my, I ended up with this. And when I did in x, excuse me. I ended up with the same thing. Well, since they were the same, and remember, I have to use my, my product rule. So I did um, I did the first, the first value, okay, so here and here. I did the first times the derivative of the second, and you multiply this by the derivative of y, which was just x, plus the second term times the derivative of the first with respect to y. And so this became x, y, e to the x, y, and then this became just e to the x, y. Now for the partial with respect to x. So there's no x's in this coefficient, so I didn't need to do that. Um, oh, I'm doing the second term, and this does have an x, and so does this. So you do have to do the product rule again. So the first times the derivative of this, which is e to the same exponent, times the derivative of that exponent with respect to x, plus the second factor times the derivative of the first factor with respect to x, which would just be one. And so after multiplying those out, you end up with the exact same thing. So the vector field is conservative, which means that the vector field is independent of path. So it doesn't matter what, what path we chose, or um, you're going to get the same value for this integral. So I've already done it with the other path. I already know that it's gonna be zero as well. So I just plugged in the zero. But you can't make this conclusion unless you've shown that it is conservative, okay? Because it may be very well that, that they're not conservative. And then therefore you can't just say, oh, the answer is zero because they're conservative when they weren't, okay? So definitely make sure that you verify that they are conservative. I don't know why, oh. I think I accidentally typed that zero <laughs> over here. And of course it was wrong. Um, but I do leave this problem for you to do number six. So you have three different paths. And as long as that vector uh, valued function is conservative, and I don't think it is. So if it were, then the answer would be the same for all three, but it doesn't look like, and you can verify on your own, okay? but it doesn't look like this vector um, field is conservative, okay? So that means you cannot 
you know, use the same answer for all three. It may have different answers, okay? Um, but number seven, we'll move on. And so number seven has the vector um, field and it has for our part A, um, I don't think I did part, oh no, I did do both parts. Yeah, I did both parts. So for part A, here's my uh, vector valued function. Um, and I have T and then one over T and the T's go from one to three. So I took the derivative and I got one, negative one over T squared. And then I put my vector field in terms of T. So X became T, Y squared became one over T squared. And then seven times um, T squared and then times one over T. And so I simplified this a little bit. This turned out to be two over T and this turned out to be seven T. So then to find this um, integral, we're gonna do our vector field in terms of T dot product with, and these are backwards, but it really doesn't matter with the dot product. Um, but it, I did put the R prime over, I have these backwards. So it should have been the other way around. This is f of t, and then this is dr, OK? Um, but when you do take that dot product, you do end up getting the same thing because you're multiplying the first two components and the back two components. And so I ended up with these two fractions, which simplified to negative 5t. The integral of 1 over t, so I have my negative 5 there. And the integral of 1 over t is ln of t, as long as t is positive from uh, one to three. And so I plugged in three, I plugged in one. Uh, you don't need the bars because the three is positive. So I noticed that they're just parentheses here, but ln of one is zero. So if this is zero, then when I multiply by negative five, that's also gonna be zero. So the exact answer is negative ln of three. If they had asked me for decimals rounded to some certain value, then I would have put this in the calculator and got that decimal value. Now for part B, part B has a different path. So for part B, my vector valued function is t plus one and then negative one third, and I distributed the negative one third. So I got negative one third t and a negative one third times a negative three is gonna be a positive one, okay? So then my t's are obviously from zero to two according to this. Um, and so I found my partial or my derivative. So the derivative of this with respect to t is just one plus zero. Here it's negative one third plus zero. Um, and then my func my vector field in terms of t would be, um, remember it's gonna be two times x y squared. So this went in for x, this went in for y squared, and then seven x squared y. So again, this went in for X and this went in for Y. And I did go ahead and compute that a little bit. So, um, oh no, I set up my integral. So my integral is from zero to two, and then I have my F of T dot product with my R prime. Then I went ahead and did the dot product. So I got all of this term times one, which is the same thing. And then I got all of the second term times negative one third. There we go. Um, and so I got all of the first term minus, it'll be seven over three and then times the rest of that term. And so then I noticed they both had a T plus one and they both had a negative one third T plus one. So I factored those out and that left me with two and one of these left over and the minus seven thirds and then one of these left over. And so I just distributed that two and that seven thirds. So um, I factored out the negative one third again. Remember it was one third T plus one. I just factored out the negative one third again. Um, then I distributed that two and I distributed that seven thirds and I ended up with these guys. I combined the like terms, I ended up with these two. Um, I factored out another negative one third. And when I factored out another negative one third, 
This became positive 9t and this became positive one. And if you're not ever sure, double check. So is negative one third times nine, negative three? Yes, it is. Is negative one third times positive one, negative one third? Yes, it is. So this was factored correctly. Then I took this factor and this factor, multiplied them together to get me positive one ninth. And I went ahead and distributed these to the trinomial and the binomial, okay? So I ended up with all of these terms, and then I combined those like terms, and I ended up with this. Then I integrated each term, and I ended up with these four terms, and then I evaluated it from zero to two. And when I did that, I got a negative 220 over 27. And I really was thinking I made a mistake, but typed it in there just in case, and it was actually correct. So you know, the more algebra and the more steps there are, the more I start doubting, like, did I do it right? Is, you know, I just feel funny about this. But then sometimes I actually surprise myself and it's correct. And I know students do the same. So that's why I'm mentioning it because it just happens. Um, you start to overthink things a little bit and you're like, oh no, I didn't do that right, but you did. <laughs> um, so be very, very careful. Um, but that is the end of this section. There's not too, too much. It's just a matter of finding your derivative of R and um, putting your vector field in terms of T, okay? Or theta, depending on whatever your um, curve is there, okay? But that is the end for this one.